Hi, my name is Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. Today I want to go over a translation that I made of Alexander Shishkin's presentation at Sochi, Russia. In part this is because I actually missed the first part of the recording and that's available on the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project's YouTube channel. And secondly, I really don't think with a few hundred views that it's got enough attention. And the reason I'm saying this is because it would appear that various people are, are moving towards uh, production technologies. And I think it's as well to look at what Alexander Shishkin and the researchers that have worked with him have discovered. This presentation I translated uh, with the machine assistance and I'm going to read uh, what he has uh, presented. I'll add in some notes uh, that may be relevant and also uh, some things that were said during the Q&A and you can go and have a look at the Russian version which will be linked at the bottom of this presentation. So the presentation is new type of penetrating radiation. To date two types of penetrating radiation have been accepted. One, electromagnetic radiation including x-ray and gamma radiation and radiation in the form of fast particles, neutrinos, electrons, neutrons, protons and ions. Now there is a, another presentation that I have translated which goes into uh, Alexander Shishkin's uh, discovery uh, for himself and also some history. Uh, it, it covers a lot of history that I wasn't aware of but also uh, it misses some things but I, I will do a separate presentation on that. But the real revelation for me uh, that came out of this presentation that Alexander presented in Saatchi uh, was that the winner of the Nobel Prize in 1917 for the discovery of characteristic X-ray radiation, Charles Glover Barkler, argued that during the study of characteristic X-ray radiation, he discovered the so-called J phenomenon, in which radiation has a greater penetrating power than X-rays of the K type. Barkler devoted all of the remaining years of his life to the study of this phenomena. However, neither he or his contemporaries could confirm this J phenomena. Okay, so um, a couple of things. I, I've given a link here to the paper that's referred to here. Uh, and uh, also I've given another link here which I've included uh, as an extra slide on this uh, next page. So several other researchers looked into this J phenomenon and here's this uh, J.A. Crowther from the Cavendish Laboratory at Cambridge University. And uh, this was from a paper uh, from 1921 and there's a link to that uh, in the PDF. The existence of this jade radiation does not appear to have been generally admitted, partly because such radiation had not been directly detected, and partly because radiation of this type is not indicated by the current theory of the structure of the atom. The latter objection, though probably the more influential of the two in producing this suspension of judgment, is not one which can be maintained in the face of experimental facts. The former and more vital objection, it is hoped that the results described in the present paper may do something to remove. So he has found things that line up with uh, what Barclay had discovered. and uh, But what he's saying is that, is that people at the time could not accept uh, this J radiation because there was no way that they could see it coming. And in fact, at one point he's suggesting that this uh, might be from some sort of interaction uh, where electrons are either very close to the nucleus or, or inside the nucleus. So it's very interesting when you look at uh, current thinking on this. The J radiations from elements of low atomic number are very weak compared with the K radiations. In the case of copper, for example, the intensity of hard fluorescent radiation was only about one thirtieth of the characteristic K radiation from the radiator. This would indicate that these hard fluorescent radiations are not easy to excite. So he's saying whilst these have been observed and they were observed by a number of people, there wasn't a, a model of the atom that, that allowed them to exist. And moreover, that they were actually very hard to create. And so uh, this is in his paper from 1921. Now, very interestingly, I was given a link by Giorgio Vassello today. In fact, I only started translating this work from Alexander Shishkin maybe three days ago. But anyway, this interview between Professor Martin Fleischmann and uh, Christopher P. Tinsley on infinite energy. 
Just look at what he's saying here. Now the transmutation. Of course, I can think several ways in which something like a transmutation can take place. And so uh, Mr. Tinsley says, any form of nuclear reaction is transmutation anyway, so it's a very, very small step. And then Fleischmann responds, but we do know that there are high energy X-rays. Gozzi has observed them to over 120 kilo, kilo electron volts. That's a big number. That's a big number, which incidentally can't arise from the electrons in K shells. Wow. So he's basically the same, saying the same thing as Barclay said in uh, the early part of the 1900s. Uh, I think this pre uh, interview is in uh, 1996. So, uh, what is the uh, what is the maximum for that? About 15 keV. That's for K shell electron emissions. Well, whatever it is, but it's a lot more. Yes, it cannot arise from anything in the electronic shell. So he's basically saying the same thing that Crowther is uh, saying in his paper in 1921. Uh, it's a lot more. Yes, it cannot arise from anything in the electronic shells. And then, almost incredulously, uh, Tinsley says, 100 kV? No way! <laughs> Fleischmann responds, no way, no way. I, yes way. So, this has got to be some peculiar phenomenon. Incidentally, this is fairly important question because, as Preparata pointed out in Japan, if you've got high energy X-rays coming out, and this goes back to Stanislav Spack, Lots, lots of people then say, well, it's soft x-rays. But soft x-rays would never get out of the cells. So they had to be hard x-rays. And this is, as you'll see, this is what is uh, being suggested, that it's, it's more penetrating. Uh, those could dump their energy outside the cell. So you can see a lot of complications with thermal measurements. It could just be because people have missed the excess enthalpy within their cell design. The cell is too small, it won't catch the excess energy. And in any case, it's only the lower bound that you catch. You must design a cell to trap all the energy in the x-rays. Once you have got the x-rays, you can ask what sort of x-rays? What's going on? Are these coherent x-rays? What would they do? Will they yield some sort of uh, photo fission process in the nuclei. So I uh, could think of lots of processes which could be going on and it will take a long time to sort that out. Now, I really recommend you go and read this entire uh, interview by uh, uh, Tinsley with uh, Martin Fleischmann because many, many, and <laughs> you will amaze yourself. I was absolutely amazed when I read it this morning. Uh, you will amaze yourself with how many things that Martin Fleischmann uh, is talking about in that interview that resonate with things that have been discussed over the last couple of years. Really, I think you'll you'll think what what is actually being said here. But anyway, he's saying that the, these are um, potentially people didn't see excess heat because their cell couldn't thermalize the energy that was coming out. I mean, it was just coming out. And this also reminds me of when we were with uh, Piantelli in January 2015. He said when he was triggering one of his classic uh, Piantelli Ficardi cells. He bent down and uh, he was looking, not looking through, but in line with the length of the reactor. And at one end of the reactor, it had a, uh, a kind of like a borosilicate window or a window in which the pass-throughs went through. And he was in line with that for not a very long time, but on his uh, right um, sort of uh, shoulder um, on, on the upper part of the arm, he got a very, very intense burn. And uh, this has uh, been something that, you know, we've uh, been very interested in uh, at what explaining for that. But this looks like um, there may have been some intense uh, penetrating radiation coming out of that. Now, of course, it being in the, the tune of 120 kV, yes, uh, it can get out of these electrolytic cells, but it would be relatively easy to stop uh, uh, with uh, various materials. So you could have no ionizing radiation outside of the reactor, but if you can use this, uh, then you could uh, uh, create a lot more options for excess energy. Okay, so now I'm going to go on with the rest of what's in Shishkin, but I really wanted to say, look, you know, uh, Martin Fleischmann uh, and researchers that were replicating his work were all over this, and it's just interesting that it's coming to light now. So Shishkin then goes on to this cosmophysical factor. In 2009, the remarkable 
review work of the Soviet and Russian biochemist Simon E. Schnoll was published under the title Cosmophysical Factors in Random Processes. In this review, Dr. Schnoll summarizes his experimental studies from 1951 to 2008 and also studied and compared the studies of other experimenters. The book contains references to more than 200 papers. In conclusion, Simon Schnoll argues that all random processes in chemistry, biophysics, physics, including fluctuation of the decay rate of radioactive elements, measured at the same time, in the same place, are strictly correlated with each other. Based on this analysis, Schnoll, as well as other researchers, for example, Alexander Parkamov and Barov, concluded that there exists a certain cosmophysical factor Call it, he calls it an agent which, which actively influences virtually all processes occurring on at the Earth and in space. So basically he's saying like, if you have a radioactive sample over here, and in the same room you, you have, uh, uh, for instance, some sort of a biological process going on, that this will decay faster and this will grow faster uh, uh, in a, some sort of correlated rate. Um, uh, and so there must be some sort of common uh, cosmophysical factor that's occurring. Now, of course, uh, Alexander Parkamov is f famous for uh, looking at cosmogenic uh, 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 relic neutrinos, accelerating the decay rate of um, beta emitters and other um, uh, sort of factors like that. And that's what's being referred to here. And it's just in interesting that he's saying um, uh, this right now, and it'll make more sense. Now, he uh, refers to a type of ra uh, radiation that he's come up with, uh, the name for magneto toro electrical radiation emter. Okay, and it's a translation of the Russian, so it's, it's not faithful um, in terms of the letters, but it is when it comes into English. Now, this makes sense to me. We have some sort of intense magnetic effect. It is a torus. It's due to electrical, and it, it moves somewhere, and so it radiates. The authors of this report argue that they experimentally registered and investigated this agent. Now, it's his capitalization. It's not mine. <laughs> uh, I've just highlighted it. So he's saying there's an active agent, which is, to me, when I translated this a few days ago, it was just, wow, okay, um, which is a new type of penetrating radiation, the search for which Charles Barkler unsuccessfully spent more than 28 years. In the spring of 2010, it was realized that numerous and diverse traces on X-ray photographic films cannot be film defects, but are traces of interaction with the EMTER vortex solitons. The author's name is Magnetotoro Electrical Radiation. For example, the photo one, which is on the next slide, shows traces of explosive unpacking of energy solitons each of which contains more than 10 to 11 electrons and at least 10 to the 5 ions. Now, I've put this note in here established by Ken Shoulders. In the Q&A, um, uh, there is a question from one of the other delegates, and they say, well, where did you get this number from? And he credits Ken Shoulders have, as having established these kind of uh, figures. So essentially, he's talking about EVOs uh, uh, as being... Uh, similar uh, bodies and of course we know that an EVO uh, is some sort of self-confining uh, torus of electrons that can then cluster or and is a cluster itself. Uh, during the explosion of such a soliton, a significant part of the electrons acquire kinetic energy up to 6 to a 10 keV. Therefore, a characteristic mechanical damage of the film in the form of umbrella and or birdie appears at the site of the, exp uh, of the explosion. Now here, this 10 keV, um, you know, 10 keV is, uh, <laughs> that's 100 million degrees, okay? And I'm gonna come back to this in, in a future presentation because uh, this is very significant. But of course, uh, Shoulders did say that these EVOs can be a point source of X-rays. So uh, there we have it. So here's the umbrellas, or the birds as they call them, birdies, uh, and these are the effects on a photographic plate. So, his presentation focus, he's not going to talk about all the things that can be affected by this cosmophysical uh, 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 active agent, uh, 
He's saying in this report, I will not dwell on how this interesting phenomena is associated with fake neutrons, with methane explosions in mines, with registration of flashes of neutrons and gamma quanta from the Earth during volcanic activity, with explosions of dust and gas, with the utility of radon bars, with homeopathy, etc. This topic is for a separate discussion. Today, he will talk about clusters of MTER in the form of string vortex solitons, SVS. So he's recognizing that MTER can form other structures, but we're just going to refer to, in this, this case, string vortex solitons, SVS. The study of this phenomena was carried out for seven years. This work began in November 2010. So basically, he then went ahead to ask the director of JINRFLNR sector, um, Mr. Maslov, and he asked the question, is the transmutations of elements under one of the birds uh, shown in photo one? So he's saying, like, in this kind of area or around it, is there any transmutations in the uh, photographic emulsion? And, and so uh, microcraters won. A week later, Oleg Dmitrievich <laughs> answered that it was not possible to reveal the appearance of new elements against a background of such a large amount of silver and asked another question. Uh, where did you irradiate the film with ions? So basically he's saying, uh, I'm looking at these, I can't find anything, but you know, it looks like you've irradiated the film with ions. Uh, and basically they then showed a, an image taken of the film using a conventional microscope, which revealed traces similar to the kind of damage caused by ions. And here it is. So here is, uh, you know, a, a microscopic image looking at one under one of the birdies. Yeah, he couldn't find the transmutation. But he said, what are all these pits? Interested in this effect, I and co-authors conducted long-term studies during which the following conclusions were made. Micro craters on X-ray films appear from excitation of atomic nuclei in a, any rapidly proceeding processes. And these are the ones that he's explored. A hydrodynamic generator. This is something like... Uh, the generator of um, uh, Leclerc uh, from revolving bodies made of various materials titanium and cadmium he's got a ref couple of references there from materials irradiated with gamma radiation from gamma sources 60 cobalt and 137 cesium by applying a high voltage pulse of plus or minus 590 volts on an x-ray film in an opaque package located between the plates of a flat capacitor with an 8 millimeter distance between the electrodes from a reactor producing a corona stream of discharge, and from generators, uh, and these are two uh, Russian uh, scientists and whatever they are, they're generators that cause um, these production of these string vortex solitons. Okay, there are not, uh, these are not only the kind of ways that you can produce these things. Uh, Kenneth Shoulders said essentially these things are ubiquitous, and uh, there are many ways that even he suggested that they could be produced. And we also know that from cavitation, which you're going to get in this hydrodynamic generator, um, and he focuses on, on this in the rest, rest of the presentation. So, uh, But cavitation in the case of like sonofusion and uh, cavitation in the case of Suhas Ralkar's device. Uh, fuel pro, uh, processor for the echo device um, they would create cavitation also now what he did was um, he looked at those craters he looked at where the string vortex solitons had translated uh, through like which materials they translated through and established that it, with an error of not worse than five percent that the diameter of the micro crater d in the film plane is directly proportional to the atomic weight a of the excited nuclei and yeah, he develops this constant. So this is diameter, this is the constant times the atomic weight A in micrometers. So th this con constant there is it's a 5% ratio uh, of uh, in potential inaccuracy. It was established with an accuracy of 10% that the depth H of the microcrater photo 3 from the film plane is inversely proportional to the square of the atomic weight. So again, uh, he's got a, a constant here and, and, and so on. And so depending on what uh, element it's been traveling through, um, He's saying that a string vortex soliton is an ordered vortex structure of cold neutrinos. Now, there's some debate about this. Uh, I actually think that he's suggesting that, uh, as I would suggest, that they also got electrons and ions in there, but plenty of neutrinos. How those neutrinos get in there, we can debate that another day. Since the interaction of a string vortex soliton with radioactive isotopes changes the decay characteristics of these isotopes. So, essentially, he's saying that this can change... Uh, the decay rate because uh, neutrino, cold neutrinos, 
can interact uh, with the weak process and uh, encourage sort of inverse beta reactions, as discussed in a recent paper by Alexander Parkamov. With the passage of string vortex uh, solitons through the material, with a high degree of probability, string vortex solitons acquire the properties of the cores of the material. So is it just kind of like somehow becoming a little bit like it, or is it actually capturing, is it eating some atoms of that material? So here's a photo of a micro crater. So the, the whatever it is has come in here and made a, a, an impression. You've got the diameter and the depth, which he's calculated here with these constants. Evaluation of the damaging factor of string vortex solitons. The micro crater shown in photo three has a diameter D in the film plane of about 1.1 microns and a depth H, also from the film plane, 38 nanometers. The trace corresponds to nitrogen uh, string vortex soliton. So essentially, the string vortex soliton has traveled through some air, which has a lot of nitrogen in it, or may, maybe it was just a nitrogen environment that they were testing. Uh, and it's uh, created a crater that's uh, um, are of these diameter and depth. An estimate of the energy released by the string vortex soliton uh, on a photographic film can be made by the volume. He goes through the explanation and comes up with a, a, a calculation to estimate the uh, energy. And here he's saying that taking into account the size of the crater area calculated through its diameter, the volume of the micro crater uh, formed from the nitrogen string vortex soliton uh, in that previous photo is this. And he says, uh, a rough estimate of the released energy can be made through energy that is required to spend on heating water loca located in the volume of the micro crater. And he's saying that on that, that basis alone, you're going to get 23 uh, mega electron volts. In the next slide, we're going to talk about greys. And uh, this is the description of greys from Wikipedia. The grey is a derived unit of ionizing radiation dose in the International System of Units. It is defined as the absorption of one joule of radiation energy per kilogram of matter. Now, he then looks at the damaging factor of string vortex solitons, uh, uh, at their potential damage to red blood cells. Let us try to calculate the damaging factor of string vortex solitons using the example of micro-objects, for example, erythrocytes, which are red blood cells, from the, which in the form uh, resemble doubly concave discs, and everyone knows what they look like. They're kind of like a donut, but they kind of come thin to, so like, like that, you know. Uh, that's what he means. Doubly concave uh, disc with an average disc diameter of 8.5 microns and with a disc thickness of uh, uh, approximately, uh, <clears throat> or variation, uh, uh, 2 uh, micrometers. So he does the calculations here and he's saying that the dose is equal to 37.8 grays and the calculation, he's being a nuclear expert all his life and he's saying that with this absorbed dose, there is a high probability that the erythrocyte, the red blood cell, will be fatally damaged, i.e. you get one of these SVSs hitting your red blood cell, it'll kill it. With white blood cells, a similar calculation, uh, it, uh, and based on the fact that uh, uh, leukocytes, which are white blood cells and uh, similar, are about 10 times larger than a red blood cell, uh, the, the uh, energy would be 3.78 grays, therefore, and the absorbed dose that may not be fatal for the leukocyte, but it m may damage, uh, you know, uh, and cause leukemia or lead to cancerous mutation of the white blood cell. Okay, so this uh, does express some, uh, you know, uh, reality uh, about what they've observed. And this is no fly-by-night uh, calculations or, or, or guesstimates. They, they, they spend a long time studying this. Here's a, a section, a small section, 220 uh, by microns by 165 microns um, of an X-ray photographic plate. And it was uh, under lead protection and then um, it was exposed for 20 minutes to string vortex uh, solitons radiation generated by a cavitator with an electric motor of 7.5 kilowatts. So <clears throat> this is kind of like one of those devices where you have a, a cylindrical thing with holes in it, or it might be uh, two concentric rings. It causes a lot of cavitation, and the X-rays were uh, plate was placed on it, and these are the uh, impacts or, or effects of the string vortex solitons. <clears throat> He identified that there were two 
uh, string vortex oliton uh, annular beams. And you can go and have a look up uh, annular beams. There's a, a rabbit hole to dig down in there. And he gives us a thickness, and uh, he looks at the energy level there. And then he goes on and uh, calculates the sort of uh, absorbed dose rate that you would be exposed to uh, from a cavitator uh, based on this uh, of 2.24 uh, times uh, 10 to the minus 2 grays per hour um, and so forth. So there's a calculation there. And he's essentially saying that conclusion is irradiation of the human body for a short time in the location of our cavitator can lead to irreversible consequences. What are the consequences of experimenting with, for example, Andrea Rossi, Rossi's reactors, with Vachayev facilities, or with plasma discharges such as that of Anatoly Klimov? Now, this is just a, a word of caution. Uh, because this radiation is coming out, he's saying that String Vortex Soliton, uh, it's his name for a variation of Magnetotoro electrical radiation, which is itself effectively a charge cluster. He self admits that it, 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 it's born out of, um, uh, it's an exotic vacuum object. Now, there's all these names going on, and uh, essentially, um, uh, he's, the Magnetotoro uh, electrical radiation is quite. Um, a little bit more descriptive than an exotic vacuum object. It's kind of telling you the shape of it. It's telling you that it's uh, highly magnetic and, and, and highly uh, and electrical in, in structure uh, and so on. So uh, thank you for watching this uh, presentation. Um, I've got a couple of extra slides here. just want to run through. He thanks uh, the cooperation of all the people he worked with on this research over those several years. Uh, both on developing of the string vortex soliton model and uh, the experimenters that he worked with. Uh, these are his references, and uh, there are links there to each reference in the presentation, which will be available. A link will be available to the presentation in the description of this video. And he also talks to, uh, uh, wants to dedicate this work to um, these researchers as well as other experimentalists. Now, I would be very happy if you could take the time to review some of the documents that uh, I've linked to. Um, I have been invited uh, to, I think, five uh, labs, and I think seven labs, including uh, government labs in Moscow, and I really want to spend some time uh, with Alexander Sishkin. And if anyone is uh, happy to support that, there are links uh, to um, donate in, in the bottom. Uh, of uh, this uh, video uh, and I'd really like to try and uh, bounce ideas off Alexander because uh, he has this wealth of experience I mean he, he's been specifically looking at this strange radiation this uh, string vortex on this Evo phenomena for, for as longer than I've, I've been looking at uh, Lena in any serious way and uh, uh, there's much that could be learnt uh, um, and this really needs to be um, uh, you know, ways for protecting against this need to be uh, discussed. And on that topic, the next slide here uh, in the Q and A, um, uh, Yuji Bashatov's wife said that uh, his, her husband, uh, after thirty years of experiments and working with these types of radiations, had established that you need to protect workers with, in his opinion, fluoroplastic plates or boron, the thickness of which should be uh, that of a sheet of glass or of glass that must be at least two centimetres thick. However, Ken Shoulders and Alice Shishkin uh, work suggests that many thin layers of conductor and insulator, saying metallized mylar sheet would be uh, a better approach. And this uh, kind of aligns with the sort of uh, aluminium and, and uh, uh, polycarbonate of, of the um, uh, Zhigalov tests on the strange radiation generators of Alexander Parkamov uh, that were done in 2017 into 18 and that were also uh, presented at Sochi. So thank you for your time. I think we might be getting to the nub of <coughs> where this is coming from. <clears throat> Obviously, there's a range of energy that seems to be coming out of these systems that are uh, quite uh, a lot uh, shorter wavelengths than a visible light. Uh, so it's no surprise that you're seeing some UV. Is that uh, direct uh, production of UV or is it uh, as these um, uh, 
uh, electrons maybe are falling into this state at which they can then go on to produce, uh, as was uh, observed by Fleischmann and others, uh, up to 100 kV, uh, uh, energies of which, which are higher than that of K radiation from elements and which could easily be lost in uh, and not thermalized in low energy nuclear reaction experiments and therefore you wouldn't see the excess heat. Uh, so thank you very very much for your time. I look forward to seeing you in the future.